Hey there, guys and gals. It's the Orange and Black Insider live broadcast. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. I am Anthony Cazenza, and for the first time in a couple of weeks, I am joined by my co-host, Scott Schulze, and he's, folks, he's fresh off of a vacation. So if his, if his takes aren't extremely hot, if his thoughts aren't incredibly well thought out, um, I don't know what to tell you, but... Uh, Scott, you are back. You are well rested. Welcome back, and uh, good to have you back on the program. Yeah, thanks. It's yeah, it was nice. It was five days out of town. No, no email, no internet, no um, any of that stuff. And not only am I back and refreshed, but apparently my technology is because I think this is the first time in a month I've actually had video working. Um, every device I've tried to use over the last months had an issue, so it's kind of nice that everything. At least right now, it seems to be working. So that's that's encouraging. That is true. <laughs> um, and and we might need to knock on wood apparently because a storm or or of some sort is has been rolling through your area and internet's been a little spotty. So um, I hope that we have you throughout the program and uh, we don't we don't have you cut out. But it is great to see your beautiful mug once again. It's been quite some time, my friend, and. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're back on the program and we can talk some Bengals. Last week, um, we had uh, Cincy Jungle editor and, and uh, manager Rebecca Toback on the show, and that was a neat neat little uh, neat little surprise. We got to have her back on the program as well. Got some great feedback on that. So thanks to Rebecca for, for filling in uh, last week as well and um, bringing some great insight. Uh, Scott, I, I, before we kind of get to some of our segments and, and all of that, um, I kind of want to just – get some of our listeners up to date on the most uh, recent OTA and, and, and now mandatory mini camp is, is kicking off. Um, I want to, I want to get everybody up to date on some of that news. Um, on Wednesday, it appeared that Cody core was carted off the field with a leg injury. Now some other, um, some other, sources and things of that nature have mentioned since that it hasn't been that serious. Um, so it's not something that um, I, I don't think we should worry about with a knee injury and all of that. But obviously this is, this is one of those things that happens this time of year, Scott. And um, I hate to, I hate to spin it this way, but those types of scenarios paves way for other players to come in and, and potentially shine. And I think, um, Josh Malone is is one that, uh, because of the size, skill set, all of that, kind of uh, every, everybody's kind of watching. Um, especially now, if if Core misses some amount of significant time, do you think that that is, I, I guess, the most obvious player to look at if if Core is to miss some time, or, or do you think we should be looking at some other uh, receivers at this point? I think he. I mean, he's obviously a good one to consider because he he is a he is a rookie coming in right off the draft, so he's a player who needs as much exposure as he can, especially with Marvin Lewis's tendency not to play the young guys. So having a guy that the Bengals did have, at least they've been saying they've been wanting to use more this year, go down. It does give someone like that who otherwise may not have much of a chance a chance. So that's encouraging. The other thing, it's and this is going to sound horrible saying this, but when I saw the news, and you, like you said, the injuries are inevitable. Someone's always going to get hurt in OTAs and training camp. You're always going to have people go out. But when I saw it was Cody Core, it was one of these things where you're kind of bummed, like, man, this was you know a good chance to be his year to kind of make a, a significant contribution. But on the other hand, you figure, okay, it wasn't A.J. Green. It wasn't John Ross. It wasn't Tyler Boyd. It wasn't Brandon LaFell. The guys who are probably going to get 99% of the receptions from the receiver core. So it's depth, and you hate to lose depth. But, I, you know, given the choice between green or core in that headline, <laughs> there, there's no – I mean, you don't want to see anyone in the headline. And, right. you know, you don't want anyone to be hurt. But thankfully it was not, you know, A.J. Green or Andy Dalton in that headline. And like you said, yeah, it, it does bring a good chance for some – and I kind of – to me, I kind of think of someone like a Jake Kumaro, who we've—I um, know a lot of folks have kind of secretly thought he's is someday. Someday he's going to make the roster and he's going to do something which hasn't happened yet. And I think this is probably his third and final year, so this may give him a little more opportunity to finally show if he has what it takes to make a NFL roster. 
Yeah, it's, and it's it's been noted that it's it's a big off season for Jay Kumaro. Um, I think James Urban, the receivers coach, noted that uh, he, he's a guy that they you know undrafted guy from 2015. He's been hovering around the roster, had some um, especially as a rookie, had some good uh, buzz around him. I guess uh, early on in camp in 2015, not so much last year. Um, and Alex Erickson was kind of the preseason hero last year and, and uh, buzzed past, uh, past Humro to get on the roster. So um, interesting stuff. It sounds like Core will be okay, at least at this point in time. Um, still, you love this time of year because you get to see all of these guys, but you hate this time of year simultaneously because a lot of guys start to get hurt in meaningless pr- practices. And if you remember training camp of last year is kind of where – um, two of the more exciting rookies the Bengals had, William Jackson and Andrew Billings, they, they got hurt and were lost subsequently for the year. Um, and, and that was kind of a big blow, especially with Billings. Those guys kind of are, are poised to have more prominent roles in 2017. So hopefully they stay healthy. Hopefully the team stays healthy. And hopefully Co- Cody Core is okay, as uh, some of the reports have showing. A um, couple other news and notes. Um According to um, Cincy Jungle and other sources, um, there's been some good good reviews on some of the the offensive linemen, uh, especially out of OTAs, um, which is to me is is great news because that's probably the biggest question mark on the team at this point right now, especially with Jake Fisher and Cedric Abwehi poised to man the the tackle spots. Um, you know, again, it's practices. It's not full contract, full contact. We'll see more in preseason, all of that. But that is that is good news. And then Scott, your boy, um, actually our boy. Uh, I think we all have grown to like him a little bit. Joe Mixon um, has apparently slimmed down about ten pounds um, from OTAs to. Uh, in rookie minicamp to to about now. I think he was about 235, 238. He's dropped about 10 pounds, and uh, he, he kind of – it was kind of funny. He kind of likened it to um, – or, or blamed, I guess, the, the travel schedule and sitting on planes for a long time, eating some good food, all of that in the, uh, the pre-draft stuff. But uh, apparently, Scott, he's trimmed down, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing and a good weight for him, yes? Yeah, I, I think it's – I mean, obviously, the big thing with him coming in was just the, his elusiveness, the way he moves, the way he – and, you know, the fact that he could do that as a bigger guy without being a huge guy. So getting back to that weight is obviously huge. The other nice thing is to see him lose that weight before he showed up and not pull an Andre Smith where he waits until training camp to come in and say, oh, yeah, I'm kind of overweight and out of shape. Maybe now I'll start working out. So it was nice That's to see point. that he kind of brought up – yeah – okay, you're saying I'm out of shape. I, I recognize that. Here's what happened. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to take responsibility and I'm going to take care of it. And he did. And he came in, apparently did what he needed to do and didn't have to have people nagging him to do it. And I, yeah, to me, that that's, that's great. He, he saw something wrong and he, he fixed it. That's a great point. And um, it, it, it plays into everything we've heard about Mixon, the, the character, which is um, obviously a guy – has some off field stuff. We don't need to go into it again, but has some off field stuff, but definitely does take football seriously. And, and to his credit and also, um, you know, you mentioned Andre Smith, I think uh, it might be a little easier to lose 10 pounds when you're two thirty instead of three thirty. But uh, you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. And um, you know, it, it's good, like you said. It's it's good to see him ready on minicamp day one, at the weight that he wants to be at, instead of on the rehab field or some of these other guys, and and where they spend the first part of minicamp just trying to get in get in shape. And uh, Mixon doesn't appear to need to do that, which is uh, which is good stuff. And um, you know, we'll uh, we'll we'll see how that plays out. Uh, some other guys on the rehab field. Um, Tyler Eifert, John Ross, a couple, you know, other guys that we expected to kind of be sitting out. Um, Giovanni Bernard also still kind of rehabbing that knee injury from late last season. And um, all of those guys are kind of still working or not suiting up. It, it varies, but 
Um, they're there. The Bengals are out there, and uh, the the practices are ramping up as they usually do this time of year. And it's uh, it's it's good to see. But uh, I think we also just because of the core situation, I think we also need to um, be a little weary, uh, I, I guess, because of certain injuries that could occur. And let's hope that the Bengals don't suffer some of those like they did last year. Um, Scott, last week. Rebecca and I went through the schedule and uh, we've been, we've been wanting to do this um, on this show for a while, especially after the draft, unfortunately, just because our own personal schedules and the show and all of that, we haven't been able to do it, but um, I just kind of want to get some quick thoughts from you on the schedule since we have you this week. Um, Not only maybe a a record prediction, but some of the most interesting games on the schedule. Um, I think I had when I did a pre-draft prediction, I had the Bengals at about eight or nine wins. I think I had them as I went through the schedule with Rebecca. I had them at 10 and six. I believe she had them at 11 and five. Um, that might be more a little bit more on the optimistic side of things. Um, or it, it could be something that is indicative of ob- the, the talent they've amassed and them staying healthy and and all of that. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on on a record and um, some of the most interesting games on this year's schedule uh, for the Bengals? I guess this might sound a bit I don't know um, philosophical or absurd, but until they lose, there's really no reason to think they're going to lose. So for a record, I guess I would just say sixteen and zero. And I know that sounds kind of silly on the surface because, you know, it's very rare. I mean, one team has done it. I guess, well, two teams you consider the Dolphins. But in the modern 16-game season, only one team's done it, and that was the Patriots years ago, and they were obviously a very good team all the way to the Super Bowl. Bengals are coming off, you know, a horrible season where they had a high draft pick, so obviously 16-0 doesn't make a lot of sense. But the reason I'm saying 16-0 is basically because they've not lost yet. And until they lose, you know, I, I want them – I think they are a good team. They're a better than average team. And until they lose, they need to show me that they, you know, can't do that. And one thing I would kind of look at is if you go back two years ago when they were 12 and four before Dalton's injury, they were 10 and I think they were 10 and two. So very good team winning lots of games. They, if you look at their roster this year versus that year, other than probably left tackle and right tackle, which you have high, already mentioned. I think that's going to determine a lot, and that's a big question. We have no idea what's going to happen with that. But boy, he's either going to turn it on and become great or he's going to be horrible. Same with Jake Fisher. You hope he's going to be decent. We really have no idea. Uh, outside of those positions, you could probably argue that every other position is as good or better this year than it was the year they were 10-2 and two. for the most part. I know there's probably, okay, you can nitpick one position here or there. One of the big holes, Bowdown was better. The kicking is obviously a lot better. Well, in theory, you probably can't get much worse than Nugent. So <laughs> overall, I think that they, uh, like in you know, the defensive uh, side, you've got William Jackson coming in. You got have um, you still have Perfect, and you kind of hope he's healthy this year. He's not suspended to begin the year, so that's a good thing. You know, you have uh, Eifert, who isn't coming off a injury. He should be healthy. You just you kind of have a lot of things potentially going your way, uh, so you kind of hope that you know. Okay, I'm yeah. I'm going to say until they start losing games, I don't have a reason to expect them to lose. Uh, which, yeah, I know it's probably probably absurd. Most people aren't going to project sixteen and zero, and I totally understand that. That's not a rational pre- prediction in the real world when there's so much you know variability and so many factors that can play in. But going on to the games, to me, the biggest games, I think, are the Pittsburgh games, both of them. And the reason I would say that is the, the division, I, I think, is going to run like it does pretty much every year through Cincinnati or Pittsburgh. The Browns, you need to beat the Browns. The Ravens, you need to beat the Ravens. The other decent, they aren't the Ravens they were, you know, three, four, five years ago. The division is going to be either Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or both. So I, to me, those are the two big games. You've got to hold serve at home. And you've got to be able to try to take one on the road. So those are the two big games that I'm guess I'm most looking forward to because they're they're all usually the most difficult, regardless of how good or bad the teams are coming in, how hot or cold they are. Those are the ones that always seem to be a struggle, always seem to be a close tight game. We are really fighting to try to get that victory. And yeah, if they win both those games, then I'm going to stay with the 16 and 0 until until they lose. <laughs> 
Well, you heard it here first, folks. Scott <laughs> Schultze is predicting 16-0 and from the 2017 Cincinnati Bengals. So if they do not do it, feel free to contact him, tune into the show, and uh, give him some guff because that's, that's a hefty prediction, my friend. Well, if they do, I'm happy to uh, – I just got Dairy Queen coupons in the mail today. So if they do and the listeners want to send me some Dairy Queen blizzards, I will not turn those down. Dairy Queen blizzards. And, and for those who have been tuning into this show for quite some time, um, Scott is a bit of a dessert connoisseur. Um, he, he really likes his sweets. And, uh, you know, people have their vices. Some people uh, prefer a, a nice cold beer. Some people have a nice glass of red wine. Um, and Scott likes his blizzard. So if they go 16 and 0, maybe possibly 19 and 0, um, and they go undefeated, you send all of your blizzard coupons to Scott Schulte and, and when, if, and, if, and, and yeah, and not the expired ones, let's not do a buy one, get one that expired in 2014 or something. Uh, let's, let's, let's get some active ones. And, and if, and when that happens, we will give you an address to send all that stuff to Scott and, um. Scott, you'll have to eat some of those blizzards on the air, I think, if, if that takes place. Okay. I don't know what your choice is in terms of a uh, favorite uh, blizzard, but... Or chocolate with peanut butter cup. Okay. Definitely chocolate. It's got to be peanut butter cup or Butterfinger. Okay. All right. He he, he knew what he liked there. So, uh, I you know, I, I, I understand where you're coming from in the, uh, the theoretical standpoint of, you know, they'll... They shouldn't lose until they lose, and I get it. But uh, I, I would think that sixteen or nineteen and zero, realistically, is probably not going to happen. Um, I, I obviously the Steelers games on the schedule is uh, th those are always the ones that uh, stand out, and especially the one I believe it's in um, early December. The Bengals host them on Monday Night Football. That's a biggie. Um, the others that kind of stand out to me, and I don't know if you have any, any additional thoughts on these. And I think, it, you know, for me, it's it. They're teams that were pretty competitive last year. They seem to be um, in that same realm this year. Um, obviously, Green Bay went to the NFC Championship game, very competitive team. But then you also have um, the Titans, which is a very interesting team. Usually, especially in recent history, that's been a team that uh, has been a little bit of a doormat. But that seems to be a pretty difficult game, especially in Tennessee. And then they they also go into Minnesota late in the year um, to, to take on Mike Zimmer and the Vikings. And then um, the, the they host the Lions in the second to last week of the season. Those are three other little games that uh, stick out to me. Um, any, any thoughts on those specific matchups, Scott? I think those would be very – I think the Vikings one, you mentioned that one – I'll take the one you mentioned at the end. It will be interesting because it's going to be interesting to see if Bridgewater's back yet. I know when he was hurt, there was a lot of talk. Is he out for his career? Is he going to come back? I know earlier this spring it sounded like he was coming back and he could actually play this year, and they had just traded away that first-round pick for Bradford. So, in theory, they now have two first-round pick quarterbacks who could be fighting for playing time. That could be an interesting situation depending on, I assume, Bradford start the year, how he starts the year. If they're rotating quarterbacks, if he goes one guy versus the other guy. And then, of course, you have Zimmer, who was known for very good defenses, and so it would just be very interesting to see how do we match up against a team that, in theory, is kind of built – like the Bengals were built a few years ago. You know, how, how does a 2017 offense face up against the Bengals, you know, 2013 defense, so to speak. So I think that'd be very interesting from those two perspectives, just to kind of see, and also to kind of see what the Vikings do with the running back situation, because after Peterson went, they signed Latavius Murray, and then they make that trade with us in the second round and draft out Dal Dalvin Cook. So I think that'll be kind of interesting because you'll have the whole, you know, Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon matchup. You can debate there who is the better pick, you know, who's, who's better up to that point, who has the better game. Did the Vikings make the right decision in passing on Mixon? Did the Bengals make the right decision on trading down? Could be one of those, you know, Steven Jackson, Chris Perry things again, where, A, we traded down, we passed on Steven Jackson, took Chris Perry, and that blew up in our face. You know, fast forward, you know, 10 whatever years later, we pass up on Dalvin Cook, trade down, we take Joe Mixon, who obviously everyone right now thinks it's a great move. Uh, we'll see, you know when that week comes, if it's still a good move and you know, three, five years in the future, 
I think it'll be, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, Mixon's kind of our boy, and hopefully we'll get him on the show sometime because we hype him up so much. <laughs> but, yeah, as far as game, I'll go with the Vikings. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and get uh, Mr. Mixon on the program if we're able. But, yeah, the great point about Dalvin Cook and Joe Mixon there. Um, yeah, I think, you know, earlier in the season, had this game been, been scheduled earlier in the season, I think we would um, look at it and we probably – most people probably wouldn't have a full grasp on Dalvin Cook and Joe Mixon at that point. Probably by, I think it's week 15, the Bengals and the Vikings face off. Week 14, something of that nature. Um, you know, we'll probably have a, a decent uh, idea as to how those two are doing at that point in the season. couple of comments in the YouTube chat. Um, Tim Jones, I'm going to be cheering for 16-0 and every game till they lose. So Tim's in your corner there, Scott. Um Jaziel Ariano, even if the Bengals go 0-16, I'm still a fan. And then Aaron Siegel, uh, we, we tend to keep fan questions till the end, but this one revolves around this, the schedule here. Uh, Aaron Siegel writes, speaking of the schedule, is there a team you guys really want us to beat that is not in our division? Uh, Scott? Uh, actually, I'm going to let you go first. I can look up their schedule real quick because I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Um you know, the, the three teams I mentioned, the Vikings, the Titans, and the Lions, are, are pretty good barometers that are outside of the division. Um, I, I think I'd like to see them uh, get after the Lions. Uh, you know, I, I think um, the Lions have, have quite a bit of firepower, including Marvin Jones on their, on their team, and... Uh, the Bengals can claim if the Bengals are winning games and, and, and are pushing for the playoffs and they can clamp down on that offense. That's a good sign. A couple of others. Um, they do not tend to play very well against the Denver Broncos and the Houston Texans. Um, those are two games, especially Houston early in the year. It's week two on Thursday night. So they have a home opener and then they go right into Thursday night in the second week of the season. Um, the Texans have major quarterback issues, but they have an amazing defense and uh, they can run the football. So and I, I believe in some articles I've been writing for Cincy Jungle, I, I believe that I tallied a one in five record from the Bengals against the Texans in the Andy Dalton era. So um, those are some games that I'm looking at. What about you, Scott? Mine, I, wanted to, I thought they were playing at Denver. I wanted to confirm that, and they are. So I'm going to say that one for several reasons. One, because we're probably going to be without Geno Atkins because of the single sickle cell trait, which means he probably can't play in the high altitude. So we're going to be facing them without our best defensive player, most likely. And it's just a team that I would like to see us beat because that's a team, if you remember a couple years ago, when we were fighting for that first-round by the playoffs after Dalton got hurt. We had A.J. McCarron in there. I think they had the safety or whatever it was, the fumble in the uh, end zone, and McCarron calls us the game. And you know, we win that. It would be nice to get a little amount of revenge or whatever from that game to say, okay, we lost that game. It kind of stuck, got stuck in the first round game. We know what happened with that. But, hey, at least we can go to Denver, possibly without our best defensive player, and end up winning. Yeah, um, the year prior, obviously, the Bengals had a gigantic win against Peyton Manning and uh, the Denver Broncos at Paul Brown Stadium on Monday Night Football right around Christmas. Um, that one, and, and it essentially that, that 2014 game essentially sealed up the playoffs for the Bengals at that point. Um, the one you're mentioning again on Monday Night Football late in the season in 2015, McCarron was in for Dalton, like you said. Who knows what could have happened to the Bengals that year if they got if they won that game, which they were. If you remember, I think they were up seventeen to three or or fourteen to nothing, something like that, very early in the game. Um, who knows what could have happened for the twenty fifteen Bengals if they got that by? You know, even if they play the Steelers or what have you in a later round, potentially Andy Dalton gets another week or two to rest that thumb, and maybe he comes back. Not that. AJ McCarron played awful in that game, but uh, I think in the way that Andy Dalton was playing that year, uh, the Bengals would have had uh, their best chance possible to, to go further into the playoffs with Andy Dalton healthy. So, um, I have big... one other thing the Denver Broncos. Yep. Go back about seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. I think it was the home opener 
or an opener when we played them. We had the game one. Do not go. Oh, we're going to relive this one. Oh, go for it. Go for it. I think we scored or something late. We have the game wrapped up. They throw this desperation pass. It was Ed McCaffrey or something. Our two defensive backs converge on the ball, knock it down. Game's over. We won. Instead, he knocks it up, bounces in McCaffrey's hands. The defensive guys kind of knock it, take it out of the play. He run, yeah. I, I don't need to uh, – if, if you haven't seen it, don't see it. If you have, I'll just stop there. Let me let me give you some names. Um, and this was 2009, and this was the game you're referencing. This was, uh, I, I believe, week one or week two, like you said. Um, the Bengals were on hard knocks that year, coming off of a very poor 2008. And they what they did, if I remember correctly, um, they marched down and they scored with Cedric Benson. Uh, and it was very late in the game, and I, I think they went up 13-7. to seven. Very boring game. And Kyle Orton threw the ball up. Leon Hall tipped it up in the air, and a guy named Brandon Stokely took it the rest of the way with very little time left, and the Broncos ended up winning 14-13. to 13. So that, that game was um, not a very fun one. Not a very fun one, Scott. Thanks for bringing that up. And uh, – just pulled up. It was week one of the 2009 season. Yep. Yep. And you're right. It was definitely not uh, Ed, Ed McCaffrey. I mean, well, I think – well, he threw it to – I think it was Brandon Marshall. And Hall tipped it up in the air, and Stokely was right there and, you know, whatever. But yeah, the Bengals that year also after that, if you remember, came, had uh, – they were kind of coined as the cardiac cats because they had like four or five major comeback wins, a lot against – division rivals which uh ended up getting them into the playoffs and um it was it was a pretty good season for them but yes not a great way to start that season after it seemed like they they had that game sewn up um thanks scott appreciate the the wonderful memories that you uh well, that's to beat the broncos <laughs> uh, well you know you uh you're you're gone for a few weeks you come back and you throw the old brandon stokely mojo on us appreciate that buddy um so, I mean, that's, you know, I know I, we don't need to go through the, the schedule game by game again because we did that last week. But uh, I did want to get your thoughts um, since you're here this week on, on the schedule and, and some other um, items on that because uh, obviously the Bengals have some, some tough games, some easier games, and uh, it does look like they can, they can win quite a few of them this year, especially if they stay healthy. So we'll see. Scott, uh, it's been a while since – we have done <laughs> we call this segment the the hater of the week um shame on us because we don't really do it every week but uh this this week we have one in the form of Jason Law Confora formerly of NFL Network and now with CBS Sports um he put out an article uh talking about the Bengals potentially moving on from Andy Dalton, um, especially after this year. Now, even though Jason Lockenfora is our hater of the week, um, th there is kind of some merit to his argument. And we've talked about it on this program before where Andy Dalton is in the last year, uh, last kind of team friendly year of a contract extension. He signed a few years ago and um, you know, the Bengals could potentially opt out of his contract after this season if they want to do that. Now, I don't know that that'll be the case, especially since the last two seasons, we've seen some really good strides from Andy Dalton, especially in the form of um, limiting turnovers and, uh, you know, high, high percentage passing, high rating, uh, good amount of yards, that sort of thing. So, um, I think we've seen some good improvement from him, but nevertheless, Lock and Fora does have a little bit of a point because the Bengals can opt out of Dalton's contract. They, if you remember, Scott, when the Bengals signed Dalton, they structured it very similar, uh, similarly to what the 49ers did with Colin Kaepernick, um, where you know it's kind of an incentive-laden deal. It's very lucrative for the quarterback, but he has to hit certain milestones, all of that kind of stuff, and then they can get out of it with minimal damage in terms of salary cap hit down the road. Um, and, and that's kind of where the Bengals are at. And 
Um, even though he didn't play in the last postseason game in 2015, Dalton before that was 0-4 in the postseason and um, uh, did not look good uh, from his fault to the fault of many others on, on the team as well. But kind of taking an excerpt out of uh, a recent article La Confora wrote and if you have not seen it you can see it on cincy jungle it's also available through cbs sports um lock and four writes i can see the Bengals going in a very di different direction moving forward should 2017 resemble 2016 and if they do they could opt to move dalton and move forward with aj mccarron as their quarterback he's younger and cheaper and while dalton hasn't been a problem at quarterback by any stretch they structured that deal with incredibly team-friendly pay-as-you-go options throughout, which is what I uh, referenced there. For all of the rumblings about them dealing McCarron the past two off-seasons, who's to say they don't let him be part of a rebuild and see what they can fetch in return for an established quarterback? Um, a lot to digest here, Scott. Uh, I, I, again, I get some of the sentiments, especially the financials of, of the situation. Um, one thing where I think Lock and Four is a little inaccurate here is um, the, the sentiment that he writes, if, if 2017 resembles 2016, well, with all of the issues Dalton faced in terms of surrounding cast last year, he still put up some decent numbers. Yes, not great touchdown numbers, but really – Still limited the turnovers. Um, uh, if you're a fan of pro football focus, they've been throwing out some statistics recently showing that Andy Dalton has been uh, great. He was great last year on deep passes and great last year on post routes. Um, in fact, probably one of the best quarterbacks um, in, in the league in those in that respect. But Lock and Fora does make the you know give the idea of. Uh, if they can save some money, if we're still, if the Bengals are still treading water in that nine to 10 win range, Dalton can't get him past that playoff hump. Um, why not make a change to a guy they seem to like in McCarron, especially because the team could have gotten some probably over the past two off seasons, gotten some lucrative draft picks and whatnot for a guy like McCarron. Um, I don't know your thoughts on locking for a, and uh, his his take on Dalton and the whole situation. I think as far as the playoff games, yeah, he had some bad games, but he doesn't play run defense, and they had some atrocious run defense efforts in each of those playoff games. So I'm not going to pin it entirely on him. And if you're looking at moving on from Dalton, and I know early in his career, especially with the playoff losses in the first few years before he started to get a little better when he struggled with deep ball accuracy early on, one of the – and was constantly – um, underthrowing AJ Green and all these things are happening. I get why some people were kind of like, okay, yeah, if we can, let's put someone else in there. But he has done pretty well the last few years. And especially last year, not only the players and some of the injuries with AJ Green and Tyler Eifert, but the turnover in offensive coordinators. I mean, he's on his third offensive coordinator since he joined the league. Um, you know, guy who was his first year doing it last year and and you could tell there were times where the offense was kind of out of rhythm and where I think um, the offense, like the co the new coaches were trying to figure out what they were trying to do. But that being said, if you're going to move on from Andy Dalton, I think the most important thing you need to determine is who are you moving on from or who are you moving on from Dalton to? Because Dalton's a, a fairly – in a quarterback-driven league, he's a fairly decent quarterback. He's not, you know, horrible. He's not, you know, one of these guys. He, he's not Achilles Smith. He's not David Klingler. He's pretty solid. He – he can put up good numbers. He can lead a team. He can hit the open receivers. He's pretty good about reading defenses in the field. I mean, he's not you know, a Hall of Famer, but he is a pretty solid, good quarterback. And if you're going to move on from that, I think you need to have someone who's better than that, you know, who's a pretty good top five, you know, top, um, you know, one of the top guys in the league, like a Peyton Manning and Aaron Rodgers, a Drew Brees, you know, someone of that sort. And I don't think McCarron is that guy. McCarron's upside is basically another Andy Dalton and his – you know, that's his, probably his ceiling. His floor is a worse Andy Dalton. So you're going from a guy, from Andy Dalton to a guy who you hope is as good as Andy Dalton just to save a few bucks when you already have Dalton on a fairly decent contract. I mean, the, the Dalton deal is one that is a pretty good one, is a team-friendly one, and he's someone that 
I think as long as you have him, unless you have a chance to sign, you know, someone who's incredible. Let's say they get a top pick and an Eric, you know, an Andrew Luck kind of guys in the draft, and you draft someone like him, or you pick someone up in free agency, which they're never going to pick a guy from free agency. But unless you can get someone who's much better, I, I just don't understand why the national media, such as a like an orphan, would say you got to move on from him. If you know, Bakarin was really that good. He, someone would have taken it before the fifth round. Someone would have thrown us an offer that said, we want this guy in a trade. We've seen enough in your practices and your preseason that we want this guy. And that just doesn't exist. There's a lot of, you know, it's like we, we do this, I think, um, as fans and I'm sure writers, you know, do that for all the kind of guys. We've done it with um, Jake Kumaro. I know I've done it for P.J. Dawson before. There's certain guys you're like, this is the guy who is just underutilized. I think he'll be great. And then they never do much. But Karen seems to have that way with a lot of people that hey he was you know big success at Alabama no one wanted him no one drafted him no one wants to trade for him but I'm sure he'll be good just put him in there and I, I just I don't know I to me I'm not saying I, I don't think he's a better option and if you don't have a better option I don't see the reason in moving on from a guy who is a pretty solid guy now unless we're and if we're going to get an Aaron Rodgers and heck yeah you know let's move on and make the trade but if you're just getting if you're just going from Dalton to McCarron, to me, I, I just don't see it. I don't see any reason for that. Yeah, it, it, there's there's a lot to sift through in what you were talking about there, Scott. Um, you know, you mentioned the Bengals getting a guy in free agency like a Peyton Manning, a Brett Favre that uh, might be at the end of their career but still could get you that last push um, to the playoffs. Now, when you look at Brett Favre when he left Green Bay and went to the Jets and the Vikings – uh, both of those teams had problems at quarterback. Um, you look at Peyton Manning, uh, the Broncos, though they won a playoff game with Tim Tebow, they wanted more. Uh, they went with Peyton Manning there. Um, and I think, as you alluded to, I think we all know that the Bengals aren't going to um, – they're, they're just not going to get the guy in free agency. Um, that's just not their, their forte – if you will, um, draft, you know, what, what Dalton does is he keeps him competitive. So I don't think barring him getting massively injured or having an, a season that is completely out of character for him. Um, the Bengals aren't going to have a top five type of pick to get a potential franchise quarterback or another franchise quarterback, if that's how you view Andy Dalton in the draft. Obviously, next year, there's a handful of very exciting players in the draft at quarterback. Sam Darnold of USC is one. Um, uh, you know, a couple other guys escape me in terms of names at the moment, but there are probably in the top five next year. Um, depending on how the college season plays out, there's probably going to be two or three quarterbacks taken within the top five picks next season, no matter who the teams are. Um, you look at it, though, Scott. Early, his first three seasons of his career, um, Andy Dalton was a guy who hovered around the low 60% in terms of completion percentage, low to mid 80s um, in terms of quarterback rating, and had double-digit turnover margins. Now, he had a career year in terms of yards and touchdown passes in 2013 with almost 4,300 yards in 2013 and 33 touchdown passes. He had 20 interceptions that year, um, and then he had an, an additional fumble that year. So, I mean, he was turning the ball over pretty frequently. Now, the last two years, he cut those interceptions down uh, to single digits, you look at 2015 when he got – and mind you, he missed essentially four games. Uh, he played in, in uh, that game against the Steelers but and had an interception. But, uh, you know, he, he was basically out for the rest of that game and the rest of the season. Only had seven interceptions with, with three other fumbles that year. Last year played the entire season, um, including six games missed by A.J. Green – um, about the same with Giovanni Bernard out of the lineup. Tyler Eifert was out for half of the season. Um, a new wide receiver in Brandon LaFell, a new wide receiver in Tyler Boyd. Uh, still only threw eight interceptions on on his most uh, second most attempts of his career, 563. Did fumble the ball five times, which is the most in his career, but 
he was also sacked quite a few times, um, both of his fault and the fault of, of the offensive line. So, I mean, you're seeing uh, that this is the whole thing with Lock and Fora's argument. Um, you're seeing things that doesn't equate to a, a, a guy that, you know, it, we're not talking about, um, you know, a, a fringe starter for the Bengals and who's letting them down. I mean, he had an, a, almost a 92 rating last year, second most uh, yards in his career, 42-06. Um, you know, it, it, it's it, this is this is kind of the the consummate Dalton argument. You know, he he always plays well enough, especially in the games you should win, especially in those games Sunday at one p.m. Um, he plays well enough to get you the win. Um, often when the team does not pull out a big win, he gets the blame. And oftentimes it is rightfully so, but the other times you mentioned it in the playoff games, you know, Andy Dalton isn't playing defensive tackle against the Houston Texans in 2011 and 2012. Um, he's, he's not playing offensive line against the San Diego chargers in the playoffs in 2013. I mean, he's, he can only do so much, but that statement in itself is kind of a conundrum too, because you talk about, a quarterback has to overcome. A quarterback has to do all these things, and uh, it, it's just—it's just an odd statement to say Andy Dalton can can only do so much, um, and then uh, you, you know you understand what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, he, he, I think there's another aspect that a lot of people are overlooking that I think you've kind of alluded to uh, when Andy Dalton like in his first year, he was essentially let me just heave the ball up, throw it somewhere near A.J. Green. And or, game, something happen. and or game manager, right? Yeah, but his second year, he got better. The 27 touchdowns, his yardage went up. His passer rating jumped up from 80 to 87. His third year under Jay Gruden, he had the 33 touchdowns, almost 4,300 yards. Had a great year. What happens the next year? Gruden leaves for Washington. He gets a new offensive coordinator, Hugh Jackson. First year in Hugh Jackson's system, he was kind of miserable. 19 touchdowns, 17 interceptions. Numbers went way down. But his second year in Hugh Jackson's system was that great 2015 season. He had 25 touchdowns, seven interceptions, quarterback rating of 106. Just phenomenal. What happens after that? Hugh Jackson leaves. He gets another offensive coordinator. His first year in this third offensive coordinator, just like he did the first two times, his numbers were down a little bit. He still, he still had a decent year, but not a prolific year as far as totals. But just like he did with Hugh Jackson, just like he did with uh, Jay Gruden, after he gets that first year in the new offense under his belt, he tends to get much better. And now that he's this, in the second year in this offense, I think there's reason to expect that you know the numbers he'll put up should be similar to 2013 and 2015 because – that's just kind of his track record. His track record is, hey, once I'm once I kind of get used to the offense, once the receivers get used to the offense, the you know offensive linemen, once we all get on the same page, we all get used to it. That first year is kind of our learning experience. The next year they really explode and do well. So I, I can see, yeah, if you're trying to base it on his bad games and his bad seasons, that yeah, it's not that good. But you're also they're also overlooking his good years and kind of you know pro, they're kind of not. I don't think they're doing him justice in projecting him by saying that, oh, he's just a middling guy. He doesn't have big years. Because he – make sure make sure I clarify that. I said big years, not big yeah, years. I, I was going to say, are we talking Mickey Mouse or what are we talking about here? <laughs> so I think the fact he's in a second, his, a second year in an offense, I think his numbers are going to go up like they always do. And that being said, I think come you know this time next year, no one's going to be talking about replacing him because I think he'll probably be coming off another very good season. Yeah, and it's it's a very interesting dichotomy that that occurs with Andy Dalton because so many times we've heard him be compared to Alex Smith, the the current Chiefs quarterback, and if you remember Alex Smith largely struggled early in his career because of a lack of talent around him in San Francisco, but also because it seemed like every year he was cycling through new offensive coordinators. And that's kind of been a little bit of the case with, with Andy Dalton um, and the Bengals. Now, um, 
you look at the other side of the coin and you go, well, why, why isn't he an Aaron Rodgers? You know, last year we talked about all of those great numbers that Andy Dalton put up 4,200 yards, um, only turn only through eight interceptions, that sort of thing. Um, did all these nice things with guys uh, on the sidelines, but you know, you look at the Packers and you look at Aaron Rodgers, who is probably the most physically talented quarterback in the NFL. I mean, depending on how you look at it, but um, uh, you look at him and somehow he still gets the Packers to the playoffs when Jordy Nelson's on the sideline and, and the defense doesn't help him out. So uh, I, I just, it's that, uh, I hate to say it, but it's kind of that Andy Dalton line, um, you know, in the, in the NFL. And I think that Andy Dalton has pushed past that and is, and is flirting with that top 10, uh, quarterbacks in the NFL, especially the last two seasons. I think he's played um, a lot better. I think he's shown some things recently, whether it was under Hugh Jackson or last year under Ken Zampezi. He's he's shown a lot of things with his legs, um, which which kind of goes unnoticed. You know, they do the the read option and he'll scramble or he'll he'll run it in for a touchdown, which uh, you know doesn't show up in the passing touchdown column, but um, definitely gets the Bengals on the scoreboard and and gets them in the games now. The other thing to note, we've talked about this on the program as well. You know, you look at Andy Dalton, you look at uh, the Bengals only winning six games last year. Quite a few of those games were by a single possession. Um, and by single possession, we're talking about a tie against the Redskins. We're talking about, I, I think, four points late in the season against the Ravens without A.J. Green, who has dominated Baltimore throughout his career. Um, you know, there, there are a number of games that he and the offense and the defense put them in position to win, but the kicking game let them down. A late play led up by the defense let them down. Uh, you know, a, a sack, I think the Baltimore game, a sack fumble uh, as the Bengals were trying to drive to win the game um, sealed that one. So um, they're right around there. He has them right around there. I think this is – the frustrating and the very difficult decision the Bengals face when it comes to quarterback and when it comes to the direction of their franchise. Um, you know, that if you look back, it's, it's the whole, and you know, I don't want to harp on this too much longer, Scott, but I do want to get your thoughts on this. You know, it's the whole almost Mike Brown mindset, which is, you know, Mike Brown does not does desperately not want to go back to, and nobody wants to go back to what we saw in the 1990s, where they were. I mean, God knows how many quarterbacks took snaps for the Bengals in the 90s. We're talking Neil O'Donnell. We're talking Paul Justin. We're talking Jeff Blake. We're talking Achille Smith. We're talking David Klingler. We're talking Jay Schrader. I mean, they, they, and, and you look at under Marvin Lewis, it's essentially been. I mean, aside from the occasional blowout in their favor or against them, I mean, it's essentially been Carson Palmer, Ryan Fitzpatrick, and Andy Dalton. And uh, I think that's why, I mean, there's a big reason why the Bengals have been far more competitive than they were in, in the 1990s. But it's the whole mindset of, are you so afraid to revert back to what you were that you don't want to get rid of something pretty good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I would agree. And I think that's part of the reason they kept Mike Nugent way too long is that that old adage one in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I think the Bengals are definitely a bird in the hand mindset. If, um, the, if anyone knows what the analogy is referring to, I'll, I'll assume they do. Uh, but yeah, they, they tend to be a team that tends to prefer. We have a vet. Trend. We know what we have. We have something that works. We don't really want to go for something better. And I think one of the, I mean, it's a good to have something that's good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like you said, compared to what they used to have, it's nice to have nice, solid players at a lot of positions. But I think when you have that, it makes you more hesitant to try to upgrade or change. And part of the reason, too, is because you're not really going to change unless you get something great. And if you're not get, and it's really hard to be guaranteed to get something great. So unless you have that guarantee that hey, if we move on from Dalton or whoever it is, 
the option. I think they're going to pre- tend to prefer the more, I don't want to say comfortable, but the more, the, the known commodity. They, they kind of know what they have in this. And unless we're, you know, guaranteed or unless this guy is just so awful that he's costing us games, we just need to move on. I think they're going to stay with what they have, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it's nice to have good things, but at the same time, it kind of keeps you from venturing further. It's like, if you have a nice job, I've got a good job, good benefits, you get pay. It's, it's nice. It's not the greatest job. It's not the, like a dream job. It's not wonderful, but it's a good, comfortable job. Do you want to leave it and try something different that you know, I could really hate the next job or it could be the greatest thing ever. And it kind of depends. You know, I think the Bengals are like, no, I've got a good job, good benefits, you know, plus retirement. You know, there's no reason to try something different, you know, this late in the game, let's just kind of stick it out. And you know, it's a, it's a nice gig and we'll go from there. I love that analogy. It's a great analogy. Um, and I'm not being sarcastic, buddy. I really do. I really do like that analogy. Um, and, you know, and, and from a management standpoint, you get it, right? I mean, right. with Andy Dalton in the game, you're, you're always competitive. You're always in the playoff picture. You're always, you know, you're always yeah. – uh, in, in the mix, and I think what the Bengals did this off season, not so much in free agency, but in the draft, um, is uh, what they did is they surrounded Dalton once again with a lot of high potential talent. John Ross, Joe Mixon. Um, now they didn't really do him uh, too many favors on the offensive line front, which is another discussion for another time. But um, they feel that they can get by with what they have, and they're going and. They're going against that, you know, let's play it safe type of mentality in terms of relying on Jake Fisher and Cedric Abwehi at tackle. So, you know, um, you can criticize the Bengals about uh, not if, – if you're not an Andy Dalton guy, you can criticize them for not um, – getting somebody else or somebody that could potentially be better, but they are taking chances at other spots and other critical spots. Like I mentioned, the, the offensive tackles in 2017, uh, Scott, we've, we've got, uh, just, just to kind of close this discussion, I'm going to get to some comments that some people have, uh, on YouTube and on Cincy jungles comment thread. Um, I don't know if this makes lock and for his argument ridiculous or not. Um, but he had, you know, he kind of ranked players in t- quarterbacks in tiers and uh, and not T E A R S T I E R. He ranks them in areas, I guess I should say. Um, he has Dalton predict somewhat predictably right in with Kirk Cousins, um, but he also has Ben Roethlisberger in and Philip Rivers um, in the same tier. Uh, because of their age and other things going on with them, which I thought was interesting. Um, you know, Roethlisberger obviously has won two Super Bowls. Phillip Rivers has um, gone farther in the playoffs than Andy Dalton has ever had. So uh, a little bit a little bit of an interesting take there by Locke and Fora, aside from just the general uh, moving on from Dalton thing. Um, in the Cincy Jungle um, – comment threads we've got a few from tabor uh tabor 11 um it, it, he he kind of just says it would be a huge mistake moving on from andy or marvin unless mike brown is willing to place marvin in the front office um he also says mccarran it's laughable that everyone thinks that aj mccarran is the answer to the playoffs um why do we want to dump a guy who averages 10 wins a year coming off of two great seasons um, you know, a little bit extra there. And then all, he, he just posted Joe Flacco. If Joe Flacco can win a Super Bowl and Andy isn't the problem. Um, and then the uh, couple of comments in the YouTube chat, um, the teams McCarron did beat were average at best. Um, we're talking, obviously, uh, I, I think that year he, he beat a very terrible San Francisco team and, uh, uh, you know, a couple of others. Um Nothing against McCarron and his, uh, he's, <laughs> and his nothing against McCarron and his physically blessed wife, um, but he isn't the great uh, as great as the geekers make him out to be. That's from Royal Flush five one three. 
Locking for it, and all NFL journalists are sensationalists from Evan Hill. Uh, also adds, I cannot understand the Dalton hate. So I think um, I think that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Bengals fans, at least those that tune into this program and read Cincy Jungle, uh, do not agree with Locking for his take. But I think – I do think in this respect – I think Lock and Four is correct in that this is a big year for Andy Dalton and and his career trajectory. Would you agree, Scott? Because yeah, of his I contract. Think, yeah, I mean, in many ways it is. I mean, obviously it's another year. It's a you know year, and not just for him. I think for the whole team because we've kind of mentioned this a few podcasts ago, or maybe a few before that. How these guys aren't going to be in their prime forever. I mean, your Geno Atkins, the AJ Green, Carlos Dunlap. Uh, you know, all these guys are getting to that point where they don't have too many years left. So I think it's a big year for all of them because you have them all together. I mean, we're starting to see some of them disappear. We lost Reggie Nelson a couple years ago and then uh, obviously Andrew Whitworth this past year. So while you have all these guys healthy and playing in their prime, it's definitely a big year for all of them to for Dalton and the team to, to get something done. And that kind of goes back to the prediction early in the than the podcast about the 16 and 0, which is maybe a bit optimistic, but the idea is you still have all these guys here in the prime. You're not starting over. It's not a total reboot. You have a lot of good guys there. And the point someone mentioned about McCarron, uh, I'd looked it up real quick, beating the two bad. Yeah. His, his two wins were a five win team, Baltimore and a four win four Niners team. And he only, he had 160 yards in one game and 190 in the other. I mean, he was basically game managing, handing the ball to Jeremy Hill. Right. And writing a defense that had five interceptions in those games. And yeah. And then the two games they need, the three games they needed to win with him and they got beat in all of them. And he had bad games in all of them. And somehow, like you've said, and as the commenter, what went somehow that makes people think he's the next best thing, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And is probably why the Bengals haven't played him and why people aren't really trading for him because there, there's not really a whole lot to, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of tape that makes you say, wow, this is, you know, everyone thinks that next Tom Brady, you know, the guy who's drafted in late rounds, probably isn't McCarron. Nice nice quarterback, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you yeah. want to do the the whole uh, Drew, Bredso, Drew Bledsoe, Tom Brady thing um, <laughs> uh, to, to fuel the fire of this of this debate. But no, I, I get what you're saying. And, um, you know, in defense of McCarron, um, he did play poorly in that playoff game, but he he and largely the defense had the team uh, on the verge of winning one of the most important and biggest games in its history um, in in the playoffs. He he did get them to come from behind. He had a, uh, I think he had two or three turnovers that game. I think he fumbled the ball three times in the game. I think he recovered maybe two of them, but um, he at least had one fumble he lost. He threw an interception. Um, unfortunately, Giovanni Bernard was credited with a with a fumble in that cheap hit that he took um, from Ryan Shazier. So the Bengals didn't win the turnover battle, but they still had an opportunity to win that game and should have won that game. Uh, let's go cry in our pillows now, Scott. Um, we're going to get out of here in just a couple of minutes. In, in case, um, if you're new to the program, welcome. But if you aren't able to join us live, you can also check this program out on our YouTube channel. So subscribe to that. We uh, not only have the video of uh, the, the program itself, but we splice it up. Um, and then we also add the videos to a number of different posts on Cincy Jungle. Uh, so if, if you listen to this program but don't read Cincy Jungle, please do that. Uh, there is a number of updates that uh, CincyJungle.com is doing um, the, uh, you know, they, they've got a number of different updates and analysis. Scott and I also write for that site. Um, you don't have to read our stuff if you don't want, but it'll be there. Um, so check us out there. We're also on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on YouTube, as I mentioned. We're on Twitter, at Bengals OBI. Um, we are uh, available via email, the OB Insider at gmail.com and you can also if you do join us live you can uh, sit in our YouTube chat ask questions interact with other Bengals fans we encourage you to do that and like uh, Justin from West Virginia um, Justin Tabor uh, who is Tabor 11 by the way uh, that I mentioned earlier 
uh, he is interacting in the comment thread um, in, in the live thread of Cincy Jungle. So you can do that every live episode that we do as well. We encourage you to do that. Um, and we appreciate all the feedback we've, we've received. Uh, you know, some has been a little critical, and that's okay. I, I wipe tears away from my eyes. But uh, others have been uh, very positive, and we appreciate the, the feedback either way. Um, and we appreciate you guys tuning in, downloading the program. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a fun project for, for myself, Scott, Connor, Rebecca Toback, and, and others who have joined us on this program. And uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in and, um, you know, listening, downloading, all of that good stuff. Appreciate it. Check us out on all those mediums. Before we get out of here, Scott, um, we do have a couple of listener questions. I absolutely love this one from Evan Hill um, in the YouTube chat. What is the Bengals' profile this year? Are they a defensive team? Are they an offensive team? Are they either? Are they a – I mean, and I'm just going to be egotistical and add some of my questions on top of Evan's questions, but are they a bombs away team now that they have John Ross, Joe Mixon, and other receiving backs? Are they – uh, a ground and pound team. I, I I don't know if I have an answer for it. To be honest with you, um, what do you think, Scott? I think it depends a huge chunk on um, Cedric Abuehi at left tackle and Jake Fisher at right tackle. If they play like last year, they're not an offensive team because they just aren't going to have time to throw the ball. They're not going to have lanes to run the ball. So without a question, they'd be a defensive team. If those guys played half as well as we were hoping they are, where they give Dalton time to throw the ball, they give Ross time to run down the field. You know, we have all these weapons now on offense, you know, with uh, a three-headed running back system as if two wasn't enough, and the third one possibly being the best of all three, and potentially one of the best backs in the league, if not the entire draft this year. They have a good chance of being a very good offensive team. That being said, and I want to tie this to a question Evan Hill asked earlier in the chat, which was, um, what needs to improve more, the offensive line or defensive line? I think, without a doubt, the offensive line needs to improve more because Bowling was had a down year last year. He played hurt, but his production wasn't there probably because of the injury. But you still have – you're expecting to get something from him. Uh, Zeitler is gone. You're hoping Andre Smith can play right guard. His big issue was always, you know, speed rushers. You probably don't have that playing inside. He was always a good run blocker. So you're kind of hoping, okay – we're kind of hoping for something there. You're hoping bowling, I'm sorry, Bodine gets better and becomes league average and the two offensive tackles. You're really hoping get to a point where they're at least halfway decent and not getting into and killed. So the offensive line you know, is one you definitely are hoping to see upgraded. The defense, on the other hand, uh, Dunlap's great. You know, Geno Atkins is elite. Billings is totally unknown, but – uh, and obviously he fell in the draft because you, know, you don't know what to expect from him. But without knowing what to expect, I think there's a lot of hype on him. The, the coaches were huge on him. He's probably going to be a pretty good player. And on the right side, you've now added um, you know, the, the kid out of Kansas State, Willis, who is probably going to be a much better pass rusher than Michael Johnson is. And then Carl Lawson, who I know they have a linebacker, could be coming up on the line a little bit here and there. So I think the defensive line – at least on paper, it looks like a really good unit. So I think the offense is where they need the help. So that being said, I think they're more of a defensive team right now until until that offensive line shows that they can block. If if they come out and block like um, you know the 2005 unit, uh, then I'd say they're an offensive team. Until then, I'm, I'm going to say defense until the offense can prove me wrong. Yeah, and I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I almost think of them. Um, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to place them in the uh, in the same category as the 1980s, early 90s, 49ers that won you know four or five championships. But I tend to I tend to think that they are a a West Coast offense type of team, passing game. It's a lot of yards after the catch, short routes, controlled passing to limit issues up front on the offensive line, but they also will go bombs away because you have AJ Green and John Ross. Um, you know, so maybe you lull a defense into play action, you lull a defense into the the post routes, 
the sideline routes, quick hitting routes, dump offs to the backs. And then all of a sudden, as everybody starts to creep up, a guy like John Ross, a guy like A.J. Green um, can sneak uh, as they get one-on-one coverage. They can sneak a deep ball here and there on a an opposing defense and, and pop a big play that way. Um, but, I, you know, when you think of – maybe the Bengals don't have – the same, you know, if we're if we're going to compare them to those those 49er teams, they don't have Joe Montana. They don't have Jerry Rice per se. I mean, AJ Green is kind of in that realm a little bit, but they don't they don't at this point have necessarily a Roger Craig. But you see some similarities there. You have Roger Craig was a guy who I, I believe was the first back in history to rush and receive for a thousand yards. Um, they got a guy like that in Giovanni Bernard. Joe Mixon can also also catch the ball very well. Um, so maybe that's kind of where they go on offense. Um, you know, the nine. There's time, big stars on defense, and the Bengals have some of their stars, uh, stars of their own. So, um, you know, if they're going to emulate a team, I would I would think that that's. Um, right out, right in their wheelhouse, based on their personnel, and especially that Bill Walsh was a, um, a a guy that was in the Bengals coaching tree under Paul Brown. So, um, you know, I I almost think that they are a West Coast like of offense, um, ball out quickly, uh, get it, get a lot of yards after the catch stuff, and then get after the passer. And I think they did a lot of things this offseason, mostly in the draft, as you mentioned, with Willis and Lawson, to get after the passer, um, get younger, get faster, get more athletic, and I, I think they've done that. Um, but a good question, you know, I mean, in the AFC North, especially as the weather gets bad, um, you know, we're talking about San Francisco, the weather doesn't really get bad um, late in the season there um, and who they play, whereas – you know, Cincinnati, they're playing in Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Baltimore where the weather, weather is terrible as the year goes on. So you you are going to need to run the football, and you're going to need to be able to do that ably as the year goes on um, and, and the games get tougher. But uh, good question there. We had another question. I didn't see who it was from. But um, kind of sticking on defense, Scott, uh, your th- Thoughts on Vigil Dawson, and they're, they're sticking him at, at Sam Linebacker. They also have P.J. Dawson, who's still hovering around the roster. They have Marquise Flowers, and now they have Vigil. Is Vigil nothing more to you, even though he's a third-round pick, is he nothing more to you than someone who could be a rotational guy, excuse me, or is he a guy that uh, can be a either a viable starter? Is he a better version of Emmanuel Lemur? Um, To me – Especially this year, Vigil is nothing more than a rotational piece in the Bengals' defense. Um, I think the Bengals are going to do the Sam linebacker spot by committee. Now, Vigil can kind of play all of the spots, which is what they like about him, especially the fact that he can kind of um, be rangy and guard the passer, or uh, guard, guard against the pass, excuse me. Um, but I think Paul Gunther is going to work different things in for a guy like Vigil, certain packages where he's the guy. Now, if you remember, Vigil was might have been a little bit of a reach last year in the third round. However, when you look at his NFL combine numbers and workout numbers, things of that nature, he's a guy who has extremely quick feet. He has shown that he has great change of direction. Uh, he can wrap up and tackle. He is a little bit more of a chase and tackle type of guy, um, which is worrisome. So, I mean, while a big play might not be let up by him, uh, a play in general uh, that moves the sticks or something like that might be made where he uh, chases down a ball carrier and, and goes from there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that you're going to see Lawson, Vigil, and Vincent Ray on the field often, um, for better or for worse. I mean, all, all of those guys – have some question marks to them. Can Lawson properly play in space? Can Vincent Ray make the big play and not just, uh, you know, kind of do his job, be a Rashad Genty type of guy? Um, And can Nick Vigil show that he he is worth a third-round pick? Now, to me, Dawson is a guy. Now, he'll probably back up more so 
perfect in certain packages, but to me, Dawson is a guy who uh, is is very interesting. Um, I don't know if he'll end up making the team. It would be a very big disappointment to me personally, and I think to a lot of fans, because he was a third round pick just a few years ago. He's been on and off the roster. Um, there's been rumblings about his proper ability to practice. There's been rumblings um, in his, uh, you know, his attitude and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but then again, you know, you get rid of some of these guys and sometimes they're just gamers and they don't practice well. They don't, they don't show you what you need in practice, but you give them the opportunity and they just make plays. Dawson has been that type of guy, um, in, in preseason. But for me, I think, um, you're going to see a lot of rotating it. And, and, and it's a good thing. I mean, I think you're going to see Vontez perfect, take a lot of snaps still, um, both on the, uh, on the weak side, as well as in the middle, um, because he is kind of a three down backer, but I do think that not only because of his injury history, the way he plays the game, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think you'll see him rotate in and out uh, at, at some points and you will see some sort of combination with Vincent Ray and, um, and Nick Vigil, uh, potentially Dawson and others coming in and out of the lineup, but, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I think last year, the Bengals, uh, they, at depth, they suffered in, in other spots. And I think that's, um, that's kind of what, what ailed them in part last year. And I think they're going to do uh, better about that this year. Anyways, uh, that's, those are some of the questions that we had this week. I think we lost Scott Schultz, Scott Schultz, excuse me, um, because of uh, a storm internet type of situation. Um, that's why I live in Southern California and not Ohio. No offense to any of you, but, uh, hopefully he's okay. And, um, we're going to get out of here since I, since I lost my co-host here, but thanks for tuning in. I want to say something to you all that are, that are tuning in though. Um, we do have at, at times a number of guests on this program. Um, and especially during the season, during preseason, we have a number of, of uh, writers from other SB Nation sites that cover certain teams that the, the, the Bengals players are going get, uh, up against. We're going to try and get some players and coaches and things of that nature on this program as the year progresses as well. But for those of you that follow me on Twitter, uh, I tweeted this out last night. Um, Ted Glover, who writes for the Minnesota Vikings in their SB Nation site, uh, apparently his father is is not doing very well in terms of health. Um, he's a little bit up there and in age, and uh, he has cancer. Apparently, it's spread to a number of parts of his body. Um, you know, I don't want to air his personal laundry there, but he did put that on on Twitter. But um, if you remember, Ted joined us and was a great. Um, a great guest of ours, uh, last year. And that's not why I'm doing this just in general. He's a great guy, nice guy, uh, great at what he does for the Vikings. So if, you know, if you can send him good vibes, prayers, whatever, whatever your thing is, if you can send him some good vibes to him and his father, um, that would be much appreciated from this program. Uh, given that, given that Ted is a good guy and, uh, we'll probably try and get him on again late this season when the Bengals try, uh, play the Vikings late in the year. So, um, you know, if you can, if you can, uh, think about him and his dad, uh, we would appreciate it. I know he would appreciate it. And, uh, just a little, little side note before we get out of here again, this program is available on iTunes, on SoundCloud, on YouTube. So subscribe to those channels. It's also, all of our content is also available on Cincy Jungle. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're reachable by Twitter at Bengals OBI, by email, the OB Insider at gmail.com. You can also tune in live every episode uh, on this program on YouTube and on Cincy Jungle. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. We're going to get, we're getting hot and heavy now in terms of uh, news and updates and all of that. We're in mini camps. We're going to get tr get into training camp. Um, and before you know it, preseason's right around the corner. So stay tuned here, the OB Insider. Um, check us out. Like I mentioned, go to Cincy Jungle and check out all of the content there. A lot of news up updates there. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. This is Anthony Cazenza for Scott Schultz. This has been the Orange and Black Insider. We'll see you next time.